We have a super cool program for you today. This year's NEA Big Read author, T. Bui, is our guest speaker. The Big Read is a program of the National Endowment for the Arts in partnership with Arts Midwest. We thank Sony Pictures and especially the creative staff at the Lincoln Heights Youth Art Center and of course the awesome Scott Bay. Today's program is presented by the Lincoln Heights Youth Art Center, a facility of the City of Los Angeles Department of Cultural Affairs. It is hosted by our very own poet, author, Bobby Gordon. And now I introduce to you Angelica Loa Perez, the director of the Lincoln Heights Youth Art Center. Hello and good morning to everyone. I... Hi everyone. I think we had a technical glitch. I hope you can hear me now. I'm Angelica Loa Perez, and I'm so happy to introduce our host for this morning, Mr. Bobby Gordon, teaching artist at the Lincoln Heights Youth Art Center, where he inspires our students in photography, poetry, and is our co-founding teaching artist of the Social Justice Community Teaching Artists Mentorship Program. During the pandemic, Bobby has taken our signature big read, Young Writers Workshop, Poetry in the Heights, our culminating events, open mic nights to Instagram Live where we have enjoyed the participation of our students and our new participants from far and wide. So we are very happy to have him here today as our host for this very special event to kick off Asian and Pacific Islander American Heritage Month in the city of Los Angeles for both the Lincoln Heights Youth Art Center and the Big Read program in Los Angeles. So without further ado, we have Bobby and we're so happy to have Ms. Bowie here with us today. Thank you so much, Angelica. It's such a joy to be here this morning. I can't think of a better way to be spending the morning than getting all together to be getting to speak with the author of this book, The Best That We Could Do, which is so incredible that Zoom can't even make it look right because it, it defies technology. Um, Tibu is an, an incredible author, an amazing human being. We're so happy she's with us. She is a Vietnamese American cartoonist and author of the critically acclaimed illustrated memoir, The Best We Could Do. And her work seeks to make sense of the stories that history leaves behind. T's debut graphic memoir, The Best We Could Do, is the story of her family in the years before, during, and after the Vietnam War. It was selected for an American Book Award, a common book for UCLA, as well as other colleges and universities a National Book Critics Circle finalist and was an Eisner Award finalist. Her memoir was included in Bill Gates's top five books of 2017 and was called A Book to Break Your Heart and Heal It by Pulitzer Prize winner Viet Thanh Nguyen. And I can attest to that because my heart has just been put, put back together upon finishing it. Um, she is a veteran illustrator. Her short comics can be found online at The Nib, Pen America and Boom California. She is a contributor to Refugees Anthology, published by Abrams Press, and illustrated A Different Pond, a 2018 Caldecott honor book with writer Bao Fi. With her son, Hien, she co-illustrated the children's book Chicken of the Sea, written by Viet Thanh Nguyen and his son, Ellison. T is currently researching and drawing a work of graphic nonfiction and graphic nonfiction about immigrant detention and deportation to be published by One Word Random, One World, excuse me, Random House. And today is a really exciting opportunity. T is gonna take us through the world of her book. She's gonna share the story behind the story of the best that we could do, the best we could do. And then we're gonna actually get to hear questions from all of you. Um, we're gonna get to ask T questions from all of you and hear her responses. So without any further ado, uh, Los Angeles, I'm so proud to bring to you T. Bui. Um, I'm, the only, I'm gonna loud, clap loudly enough so that I can represent all of, all of y'all since she can't hear you, but I know that you're all going crazy wherever y'all are. So T, thank you so much for being with us. We're so grateful for this book that you've, that you've created and for being with us today to share it with us. Oh, thank you for such a warm welcome, Bobby, Angelica, Elizabeth, and everybody. Um, the, uh, I wanna pause for a second and just say thank you to all the teachers, the educators, the staff um, who have made this happen. And um, thank you students for joining me this morning. And um, I'm sorry if, if <laughs> I'm, I apologize also for being required reading, if it was required, I hope that didn't take away from your reading pleasure. <laughs> um, <clears throat> this is so awkward. 
Um, I wish I could see you because uh, your faces would make it less awkward, but we'll try, we'll try. Um, also, I have a cold this morning, so I'm gonna try extra hard. Um, <clears throat> I'm up here uh, in Northern California. I'm in Berkeley, um, otherwise uh, called um, the unceded territories of the Ohlone people. And I'm really excited to um, share with you a little bit of a reading from the book and, um, and then some of the behind the scenes, like Bobby said, and um, then I can't wait to get to your questions, which I will answer as honestly as possible. So um, without further ado, let's just jump right in. So the best we could do is, um, as my mother likes to say, um, mostly nonfiction, or it's like 99% true. We'll talk about the parts that maybe are the part of the 1% um, questionable. But um, it took me a while to figure this out, but it is very much a story about um, how hard it is to be the children of our parents. Because have our parents ever looked at us and felt slightly disappointed? Such high hopes, so much possibility to fall short. And though my parents took us far away from the sight of their grief, Certain shadows stretched far, casting a gray stillness over our childhood, hinting at a darkness we did not understand, but could always feel. These are the people I come from. Ma, bo, lan, bik, ti, thumb. I figured out in my thirties, more or less, how to raise my little family but it's being both a parent and a child without acting like a child that eludes me. My parents escaped Vietnam on a boat so their children could grow up in freedom. You'd think I could be more grateful. I am now older than my parents were when they made that incredible journey, but I fear that around them, I will always be a child and they a symbol to me two sides of a chasm full of meaning and resentment. Travis and I moved to California in 2006 to raise our son near family, trading the life we had built and loved in New York for a notion I had in my head of becoming closer to my parents as an adult. I don't know exactly what it looks like, but I recognize what it is not. And now I understand Proximity and closeness are not the same. How did we get to such a lonely place? We live so close to each other and yet feel so far apart. I keep looking toward the past, tracing our journey in reverse, over the ocean, through the war, seeking an origin story that will set everything right. And then I wanna skip forward to another part of the book because it is also about, you know, this uh, place that I come from that we, uh, so, so to speak, lost um, and, and how I reconciled myself with that and how they were, um, limits to my understanding of that place, even when I got to go back to that place for the first time in 2001, when I was in my twenties. Um, we each had our own reaction to this homecoming. Lan already scouting ahead, Ma and Bic the most excited, me and Thumb documenting in lieu of remembering. We didn't know the people there and we didn't go inside even standing there right in front of our old home, I had to rely completely on other people's stories to, rem to picture what it was like when we lived there. Lacking memories of my own, I do research, lots of research. Hello, T. I brought you a video I found. Vietnam War with Walter Cronkite. The narration is only okay. 
But what I thought was neat was seeing footage of our old neighborhood. Really? Come on, bowl. Mm, if you like it, I'll get you more. Five days after the combat began, the enemy was still fighting. George Severson described the battle in one of Saigon's slums. This neighborhood is called Ban Kuo, or the chessboard, because of the maze of alleys and passageways. Its residents are mostly poor working people, and its slums are a refuge for Saigon's hoodlum and criminal elements. A Southeast Asian version of the Lower East Side, or the Algerian Casbah. <laughs> I know this is caricature. But lacking memories of my own, I've come to depend on other people's stories. Uh, the Lower East Side, I'll draw it like that. I still have the chessboard my father made when I was a kid in the wooden set of pieces that we played with. Revisiting this game of war and strategy, they think about how none of the Vietnamese people in that video have a name or a voice. My grandparents, my parents, my sisters, and me, we weren't any of the pieces on the chessboard. We were more like ants scrambling out of the way of giants, getting just far enough away from danger to resume the business of living. Soon after that trip back to Vietnam, our first since we escaped in 1978, I began to record our family history, thinking that if I bridged the gap between the past and the present, I could fill the void between my parents and me. And that if I could see Vietnam as a real place and not just a symbol of something lost, I would see my parents as real people and learn to love them better. So <clears throat> I think I'll maybe pause there. I could go on, but um, I, I would maybe, I'll maybe call up Bobby to help me turn this into more of a dialogue that makes it relevant to you. Cause you know, having finished the story, I feel like I've gotten to fulfill my life's dream, which was to like get this weight off of my shoulders um, and put it into something that I could share with other people. And so um, I feel like everything else is gravy and I just want to spend the rest of my life being useful. Um, so, you know, we've gotten you all here today. Like, how can we make this conversation that's like very, very specific about, you know, my experience, my book, how can we make it relevant to you in this really pivotal time in your life? Um, I feel like you're living, y'all are living a lot of history right now. Um, maybe you feel it maybe you are more concerned with like what's happening like in front of you right now and how you how are you going to get through this to the next day i know that when i was a senior in high school that was the year that the rodney king trial happened and the la uprising happened but was i thinking about that every day probably not i was probably also devoting a lot of my headspace to like you know student government and getting through my ap classes and applying to, to college and figuring out how to pay for it um, and you know the boy that I had a crush on. So I don't know. It's it's all hard. It's a lot all at once. Um, and something like a book or making things, I think, helps you sort it and and have a place to like put all the puzzle pieces so that you've got like a a table at least to work out your questions on. And so that's really what this is. It's not the memoir of a great person who uh, did all this great stuff and then sat down to tell you about it. It's more like a person who had a lot of questions, whose parents went through a lot of stuff. Um, and the book was a vehicle for me to ask questions. Mm. I don't know that I really came up with all of the answers, but it definitely was helpful mm. to uh, have a place to work out the questions. Yeah. So, yeah. so should we get to questions, Bobby? You know, I, 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 I'm, oh, I, there's just so many things to resonate with and, and respond to. Um, T, I, I love 
that idea of creating as a place to ask questions of, of writing and art making as a way to ask questions. It, it makes me think about the, the poet Aurora Levins Morales, um, who said that asking questions can be as good as answering them. Um, and I'm so curious, I think well, like one of the things that all of us are learning how to do um, is how to find our own voice and how to speak our, to tell our stories which are so often silenced um, and so and the, the healing power of telling story and the connective possibility in telling story. And I think one of the things um, that the best we could do models really powerfully, I think I, I appreciate the humility in what you said of it not being a great like a, a memoir of a great person. I would argue you're pretty incredible, <laughs> but I but I also think it's a great memoir of someone of, of a human. So like of someone who like uh, like so many people can relate to your story in different ways. Um, and so I guess like as we're going into student questions, I guess one of the things that I'm, I'm really curious about all of us learning and all of our students learning is the process of finding your voice as a storyteller. I know that you've been a writer for a long time and you developed your skills and have now been a, an illustrator for a long time. I'm curious for you in the, in the course of your life, thinking back to, to T-Boy in high school, you finding your voice and what that experience was for you. Um, yeah, uh, let's let's pull up a picture of T in high school. <laughs> I think I have it somewhere mm -hmm. here, somewhere here in my slides. Um, oh yeah, here's baby T. Uh, here we go. Actually, I have to share my screen again. Don't I? Okay. Can you see this? <laughs> This is, yeah. this is, I think, me at 17 or 18. Um, uh, I don't know why I'm in this picture with a football player. <laughs> <laughs> High school was very puzzling for me. I, I think I like my inside, my, pic, my image of myself was very different from how other people saw me and I still can't, can't quite reconcile that. Um, cause I was just a big nerd as far as I was concerned. Um, and I felt lonely a lot of the time, but I was also like super active in high school cause I had so much energy. Um, also it was the only way that my parents would let me out of the house was if I said it was related to school. So I think that was maybe, <laughs> um, an, an, an impetus for, um, like just being so active. Mm. Um, uh, yeah, I also had this creative side that, um, you know, sometimes had room to, to express itself. I, I didn't have great art classes. I kind of wish I was able to work with a good visiting artist like you, Bobby, but we didn't have that mm. at Kearney High School in San Diego uh, in the early 90s. Um, classes were big, you know, there was auto shop and then there was like AP classes. Mm. And then um, I think I dropped out of art class because we were just drawing circles and squares and then we started painting the furniture in the room so i was like i'm not really learning anything here let me go try out something new um so i tried out drama and so um i think i always associated like my creative pursuits with like just being on my own because that's how i had to do it growing up mm. um just reading books i was like went to the library and would check out books on my own and um if books were assigned in class, and this is why I apologized earlier for being assigned reading, I didn't really enjoy them because I had to read them so slowly. And then I had to answer these questions that, you know, just kind of got in the way. Mm. Um, so I just read books for pleasure. And I read like just a lot of extra stuff um, based on my own interest. Um, and then I would write uh, just for a lot of like fiction, fantasy, um, poetry, really, really emo poetry. Um, Edgar Allan Poe was a big, you know, inspiration. Um, and I always drew since I was little and my parents gave me sketchbooks. So it was like just a place for like my own private stuff. Um, and I don't think that I really thought that it was something that like other people would be interested in for a long time. I think the kind of writing that I did for the public was a lot of like persuasive essays, like, mm -hmm. please give me money to go to college kind of writing. <laughs> that was, that was my earliest public writing. Um, the, the emo poetry rep re resonates a lot with me. That was how I made it through high school myself doing yeah. youth speaks in the Bay, writing a lot of, a lot of emo poetry. Um, and I, 
I'm I'm so um, I'm so moved by the experience. I, I I wish like I'm thinking about the books that I read in high school that were required. They were not as amazing as as your book. And so I'm if it's going to be required reading, let it be an incredible graphic novel that is so um, like aesthetically inspiring. There's so many different ways into the story, be it visual, be it be it um, be it with the the dialogue that you're sharing with. There's, there's so many different ways into the story um, that whether we whether we're visual folks, whether we're poetry folks, what, like whatever, whatever sparks you, there's so many different ways into the story. And we had about 25,000, sorry, 2,500 students throughout Los Angeles Unified that had a chance to read uh, the best we could do. And I have so many questions, but, and I also, um, I'm almost like holding myself back because I could spend just, you know, the whole hour asking my questions, but I'm so much more interested in the questions that the students have. So I'll, I'll hold my questions back for now and, and, and jump to them. So if we can pull up the first question um, from a student, we've got Devin from Franklin High School in Mrs. Williams' class. Um, and Devin wanted to know, what was the part of the book that you had the hardest time writing? I mean, you spoke about you know, like this, the the moment, the, the history that students are living through now and how challenging it is, the same could absolutely be said about the history that you share in, in the best we could do. And it's not a simple thing to do to share your story or to bring all that up. What was the hardest for you? Um, the hardest part of the book to write and draw. And the, and then I think it's important that um, that I, I talk about the drawing part because that, that is part mm. of the writing for me, but the drawing takes longer like it takes a lot of time to like produce the image that goes with the, the text. So that actually influenced like what I ended up including in the book. Mm. Um, there were interviews with my dad about like his early childhood memories of war, um, the first Indochina war where he was like, you know, getting covered by his mother's body from bullets and, and hiding in mm. ditches and, and all of that. And I drew that to some extent, but like he had some descriptions that were very graphic of things that happened to villagers done by soldiers that I tried to draw, but those were some bad days of trying mm. to draw these these really intense images of graphic violence in war. Mm. And I ended up deciding not to do it mm -hmm. um, and investing the time it takes to create, to like create images that I wanted to exist in the world. Mm. How yeah. did you, how did you like, what was the experience of like honing that inner compass of deciding what was the heart, the, the tough story that had to be told and the story that wasn't going to, that would, that might do more trauma than insp inspiration, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. I think um, kind of like when you're doing performance and you, you realize you can have things happen off stage and the audience can sort of use their imagination to fill in the gaps. Mm. Like that, that, ex that exists on the page in comics too, like in, in the gutters between panels, like mm -hmm. there are things that you can just not show, but you can suggest. And that's mm. sometimes enough. Mm. Mm. Yeah, it's cre creating that, that space for the reader's imagination to go to, to, go to work. Mm -hmm. But mm. they don't need to be re-traumatized by it. Yeah. Um, and you you spoke about the 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 experience or the process of of drawing and the the, the lengthiness that, that 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 took. We had a couple of students that were really curious about the specific um, aesthetics that you chose for the drawings. If we can pull up the the, the next few questions. Well, as as the next questions are making their way up, I'll 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 ask them so that you can you can start mm -hmm. responding to them. Um, so there's such a specific and beautiful aesthetic that you chose to 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 draw this book in, um, using very sparse colors, specifically oranges and blacks. And so Eric from Franklin High School, Daisy and Joshua also from Franklin High School, we're all really curious to know what was the choice behind. You, um, the color palette that you chose and deciding to not use other colors, but to really have it live in these blended oranges and blacks. Yeah. Oh, first of all, I wanted to say just like, I'm so taken with the aesthetic of this whole Zoom right here. This is like the prettiest Zoom that I've ever been on. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm really happy to answer this question about aesthetics. Um, While wow, we're surrounded by this, the aesthetic. Yeah, Absol we're swimming absolutely. in this, this, this sepia tone. Um, so uh, I'll give you the the uh, the 
<laughs> the practical answer first. Why was it done only in orange and black? Um, it's it was cheap. <laughs> it, was, it was it was cheap. And I'm not saying that like this this orange was on sale or anything. It's actually just cheaper printing wise to do mm. a black and white book. Um, that's like the cheapest way to print comics. Um, that's and that the was the real artist hustle answer. <laughs> For that. real, yeah. I mean, that. like it costs money to make to produce books, right? Um, so the original proposal was for a black and white book. And then like partway through the process, I started started really like getting interested in if I could add a color. So I asked, what well, could we do like duotone or something like that? Cause I wanna like get some of the emotional quality of a color wash. Mm. And the, uh, the book designer said, let me do some research and I'll get back to you. And then she got back to me and said, you can afford one color. <laughs> <laughs> so then I had to go through the entire um, Pantone library in Photoshop and like try out different colors that would work in everything from like 5% to 100%. And it's really tricky, right? Because if you pick like a red that like looks really perfect at 100%, like, and you tone it down to 10%, it's pink. Yeah. Um, and then it's like what color, uh, what paper you print it on matters too, if it's glossy, if it's warm, if it's cool. So I tried out like three different colors on three different papers and I took them to a workshop of like other cartoonists who were mm. like, a lot of whom were like really skilled screen printers and like knew a lot about things like risograph printing. And they were like, we don't like any of these choices. <laughs> so they sent me back to the drawing board. <laughs> And uh, I went through Those the, are the, the most whole important library, yeah. artist friends to have, the ones that'll be honest with you about your process. Yeah, yeah. They were like, that brown that you're so into looks like Rizzo gold. It looks mm -hmm. like it just came out of the tube. So I was like, man. And I went through the library again. And then I found this one, like this reddish orange color that reminded me of the apartment building that we grew up in. And mm. like the color of like the old photographs from the 80s that are like kind of getting discolored now. Mm. In the afternoon light in um in San Diego and in Vietnam mm. so it was like the color of nostalgia for me I was mm -hmm. I knew that I wanted a warm book a lot of graphic novels have this blue color mm. um, and I tried that out but it, it didn't feel right mm. that's that's so beautiful and like to see how much content and meaning and emotion lives in that specific aesthetic choice like the, the, the memory of that time of day of that feeling of the house there's a there's a amazing um, there's a colleague of mine named Brian Bain who talks about aesthetics being the opposite of anesthesia. So mm. like anesthesia numbs us and puts us to sleep, whereas so much lives in the aesthetics that wakes us up and it it takes us right into that moment. Um, so I, I it was so palpable that feeling of that that late afternoon light, that nostalgic feeling, that day ending it was yes. I thank thank you for sharing. It's the kind of thing where like. We might not know that literally as the audience until hearing it, but we feel it on in an embodied way as well. And I think that's really um, one of the things that you've unlocked with this this form of it being living as a graphic novel, as opposed to just the story that you could have told in, in words. Thank you. Yeah, I was also like working against a lot of stereotypes that might still exist in people's heads from all of the Vietnam War movies that are out there, which uh, I could go on about, but you know, this was basically my, my revenge project against them. Mm, um, <laughs> yes. Yes. So I wanted to replace them with images of my own making. Um, mm. and so it was important to like put new images in people's heads. Mm. That's that's really that's really powerful. Thank you for thank you for sharing that. And I know that there's a lot of young people in, in LAUSD having an analogous experience of, of, of needing to push back against really messed up, wounding, painful stereotypes. And this possibility of storytelling to be sharing your own story and sharing your own image so that you're not um, having to, to accept a stereotype or having to accept someone else's vision of you. That's a really, a really powerful example in the possibility of the possibility of story. Um, and coming back to the, to the, next, to the next student question, um, and thinking about those, all of those, that, that pain that you're responding to, the stereotypes that you're responding to, if we can jump ahead to the, to, the, to the next question from Renee V from Franklin High School. So we've got a couple questions about the, the, the colors in the story. 
Um, and then Renee was, was wanting to know about that experience of what you were responding to and the, how important that lived experience was and what you were creating. And they wanted to know if you could skip all of the suffering and pain and end up with the same answers, would you do it? Like how important is suffering to understanding? And if there was a, a genie who could somehow grant you all the knowledge that you would learn over the journey, would you take it instead of going on the journey? Hey, Renee, I, <laughs> you're yeah, like students, so wise. <laughs> that's a poem in and of itself. Students are going in. Yeah, that's this is a really profound question. Like, would you do it? Um, gosh, um, I don't know. I mean, it's tempting. It sure is tempting, right? Like, well, if you could, why wouldn't you? Um, mm -hmm. Like, what attachment do we have to suffering? I mean, like, this is all I know. <laughs> this is all mm. I know. All, all the good stuff that, like, I've, I've learned, I've figured out, I think has come through some amount of pain. So mm. I think like my, my human, my limited human brain is, is going, no, there's no other way. Mm. Um, I sure would like to live life with more enjoyment and, and, and just like more ease. Um, and maybe that's like my life's work now is to learn how to do that. Mm. Um, so Renee, if you want to hook me up with your genie sometime, like, <laughs> You know, in, <laughs> give me another year of therapy and I'll, yeah. <laughs> I'll, and give me a second chance with that genie. But for now, I think I have to sit through, I have to sit through the suffering a little bit longer. Okay, so we'll, we'll have the genie double back. Yeah. Um, and similar question, but a, but a little bit different. Ryan was wanting to know, uh, same class, uh, from the same class, did you think about rewriting or changing parts of the book? due to the trauma it brought back. You mentioned the parts of the story that you did decided not to include, the violence that you decided not to include. Were, were there parts that you had created that the experience of seeing them created made you made you want to change it just because it was it was so intense? I think I thought a lot about the ethics of representing trauma a lot. Um, mm. Is that, you know, I had a, an academic advisor at the time who kept quoting Edward Said to me. She said, mm -hmm. um, all forms of representation are violent. And that was completely terrifying to me. It was like completely mm -hmm. paralyzing. I was like, mm -hmm. well, how am I gonna do this yet? And then? Cause the last thing I wanna do is like do more violence mm -hmm. by misrepresenting people who have already been misrepresented in so many ways, right? But, uh, on another level, like to replace the stereotypes, you have to like just take a chance, yeah, and and believe in yourself enough and give yourself enough grace to make mistakes mm. and and um, maybe also create some like buffer <laughs> zones mm -hmm. <laughs> around your mistakes. Um, and for me, those ended up being collaboration with my parents and trusting them to be like editors as well. Mm. Um, but yeah, I, I didn't want to create any thing that was uh, I wanted to create a book for healing mm. so there are a lot of Vietnam war stories that like I has I still have not seen like still haven't watched the 10 part Ken Burns documentary because I'm just not sure if it was created for me mm. I think it was part of it's part of a healing process that like Americans of a certain mm. d d demographic are still processing mm. and that's great for them but it might not be for me and so it's yeah. hard for me to step into a, a, a some content that might trigger all kinds of feelings of trauma in me without mm. providing me with any of the tools for healing mm. um, so i knew that i wanted to create a space for healing for people like me mm. and because I'm, I'm an educator i also created access points for people who didn't go through the same experience mm. but that that was my general guiding principle does it yeah. heal yes okay Mm. And I think all like that, even if the Ken Burns documentary was like for you, it's not by you. It's 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 an outside white United States scene voice speaking about it rather than you sharing your own your own story. Right. So we have trust issues. Yeah, <laughs> that's putting it mildly. <laughs> um, uh, and through this process, I think one of the things that you've modeled is the the, the ability for he, individual healing and collective healing through writing story, through witnessing story, through sharing story, the, the, the creation of new images, the creation of new representations. I'm, and Jacob, 
um, from Franklin High School and Miss Williams class wanted to know, do you feel better after telling your life story through a graphic novel rather than holding it all in? So many, so many times we feel pr pressured to keep our stories inside, to not share. And you've done this really powerful thing of sharing your, your very personal story in such a beautiful way. How has it felt for you as a, as a person, as a, as not just as an artist and as a, as a writer, but just as a human being, how do you feel having shared your story in this way? Um, <clears throat> super vulnerable, <laughs> I'll be mm. honest, because I think I'm asked to talk about it a lot too, so it's not done. Uh -huh. um, and you know, it's been a few years since I wrote it. Um, and, and so I think I'm still kind of like constantly processing it. Um, but I will tell you the story of like when I went back to Vietnam for the first time after I completed the book already, it's like I saw Vietnam through different eyes. Like, mm. like I didn't, I wasn't putting all this pressure on this place anymore to like answer questions for me. I wasn't looking at every person like, are you my auntie? Are you my uncle? You know, mm. I wasn't like looking for my own personal narrative through other people in Vietnam. So I, I could finally objectively see it for the first time as a country mm. of like, over 90 million people who are not me. Mm. Um, and then I started getting interested in Vietnam in the present day, rather than like a Vietnam of the past. Um, mm. So that was really freeing. That's beautiful. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that. And thank you, like acknowledging also the vulnerability that you're offering in this moment of sharing, of speaking <laughs> about it again. That's, that's so true. Um, and we've got a student with, a, with a, a question requiring a whole lot of vulnerability. So I, please, All right. please, please, <laughs> please uh, share what you feel comfortable sharing. Mm -hmm. um, we've got a, a student wanted to know, um, what advice would you give to young people arriving to this country? I mean, thinking about there's so many immigrant students in Los mm -hmm. Angeles Unified. Um, I, and as, an, as an artist, as a writer, as a human, what advice would you have for young people uh, arriving to this country in, in this in this moment in time? Um, just remember to breathe. Mm. You know, take your time. Remember to breathe. Breathe in um, the things that you need for yourself in this moment. Um, breathe in the nurturing of of the people who are there to support you. Um, breathe in like the moments of calm that you may be able to have now. Um, and, and breathe out the frustrations and the loneliness and the, the, the like feeling of disconnect that you might have. Um, and breathe out the, the grief and the, the um, I don't know, just just <laughs> breathe out anything that that you can't hold in and mm. and, and and maybe find just moments for yourself. Mm. Um, and then uh, language is so important, right? Like if you're um, if you're not able to express yourself in the language of, of, of the people around you, it can be very difficult. Mm. Um, and so allow yourself to have a space where you can express yourself in the language in which you feel comfortable. Mm. Um, and then uh, ask for support, you know, mm. like ask for translation, like kind of be entitled. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm encouraging, I'm encouraging newcomers to, to feel entitled to ask for what you need. Mm. Yes. Uh, and a, a related question, and as you're, as you're answering, I want to also give a call out to the students. Um, we've got a little bit of time and we've got a Q&A. So if you have any burning questions or we've talked about things that have inspired other questions for you, go ahead and put those in the Q&A portion of the, of, the, of the Zoom and we will hopefully be able to get to those in a little bit. Um, but a, a related question, and maybe it's, maybe it's the same answer, maybe it's different, um, but I'm curious T, what is something that you wish someone would have asked you um, or said to you when you were when you were arriving in the U.S.? What's something like th thinking about that moment? What's something that you didn't hear that you wish you had heard? Um, I think that it was more of a feeling, like more of a general feeling, mm. of um, being made to feel different and mm. and and not part of the norm that 
wasn't healthy for me. Um, so like, I, I, I didn't want to be singled out ever, you know, I didn't want to yeah. be singled out for ESL or I didn't want to be singled out to have to tell my story in front of everybody if I didn't want to. I didn't want to be singled out for like make, you know, my mom sending me with different food to school. I just wanted to be me, you know, mm. um, and it th didn't mean that like I wanted to be just like everybody else in the, in, and, and like assimilate to all American things. Mm. Um, I just wanted like difference to be normalized. Mm. Right. And so I, I think I finally got that in high school. You, you saw the pictures of, of the kids in my high school, like, mm. odd, like oddly enough, like when my, my mom started making a little bit more money at school, at, at, at work, because she started out making like $3 an hour on an assembly line. And that's how she supported a family of six. So we were, we were pretty poor mm. when I was growing up. But um, when she started taking cl night classes and, and kind of working herself up in the company, we finally moved into a house. We still mm -hmm. rented, but like it was a nice house and, you know, I had more space and, uh, but like ironically it moved me into a part of town um, that put me in a, uh, the zone for a high school that had a worse reputation. Mm. And so I tried not to go there, but then, and they said, no, you got to go there. So I went and it turned out to be the best thing for me. And I learned that um, it only had a bad reputation because it was full of black and brown students mm -hmm. <laughs> like me. Mm -hmm. um, so I mean, it was so ironic because it ended up being like really great to be in the school of like kids who were immigrants and refugees and like who grew up poor or in parents in the Navy. And like, there wasn't this like big class divide that there was in my previous schools. Um, and it was just normal to be all of those things, right? And mm -hmm. that, that's all I needed was mm -hmm. just to, to have my life experience be just like anybody's. Mm. I love that the, 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 the line that, or the, the phrase that's really hitting me in the heart is normalizing difference. Uh, like not, not homogenizing everything or not acting like it doesn't exist, but having it be normal, having it be mm -hmm. welcome and more, more than accepted, celebrated. Yeah. That's really beautiful. Um, and we have, we have one more question, pre-prepared question. And then again, I want to remind, uh, remind folks um, if you've got questions, you can go ahead and put them in the chat. I also want to encourage all the all the students out there. If you want to wave as a class or any, feel free to jump up and in 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 the various emoji ways you can jump into the conversation. Please do. Um, and we've got this is a super zoomed in question. At least I'm seeing it zoomed in. There we go. Um, one, I think one of the beautiful things about telling your own story. I think you spoke to it in the way that you mentioned seeing Vietnam differently is that telling your story uh, writing makes you read in a different way makes you like observe in a different way and so i'm i'm curious i'm curious as a writer what are you now reading for fun what are you enjoying to to take in i'm curious about it and i'm curious because one of the students asked it so this is a question question from a student what are you currently reading for fun yeah <laughs> okay so this is going to take me back to renee's amazing question about like do you really need to do any more suffering um <laughs> <laughs> so this is what my nerdy self is reading for fun right now. Actually, I'm going to turn off my background so that I can share. How do I do that? I think the, the three dots next to in the, yeah. in the top right. Okay, here we go. Oh, now you can see the space that I work in now. Um, <laughs> I'm reading a book about loneliness. <laughs> it's called <laughs> it's called Seek You: A Journey Through American Loneliness, and it's a mm. it's a graphic novel mm. as well. Um, it's kind of an essay about like Americans and their loneliness. <laughs> mm. So um, I think a lot about like isolation now. You know, like with the pandemic, we've all been like extra isolated, um, but we were isolated in ways before that that like mm. kind of affect like the way we engage in politics, the way we engage in consumerism, um, or the ways we don't engage, right? Mm. So it's something on my mind a lot because I'm like trying to figure out like, how do we get to a better place? How do we, you know? Mm. And so then I, 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 I spend up, I end up spending a lot of time thinking about like, why are we so messed up? Mm. Um, so maybe that's just, that's just how my brain works. I, I think it's a question that we're not, we're not asking enough, like thinking about like, all of the ways in which the structures of our society aren't, aren't aren't serving us nearly as well as they could and the possibilities of being an active changer of that um, yeah yeah and so, so storytelling as a way to open up the imagination of that yeah what were you going to say yeah ultimately it's an optimistic move on my part to like mm. wade, wade through all of this uh sad stuff 
Mm. Yeah, because if there's no if if you were taking like a nihilist perspective, you'd be like, why would you do that? There's no point. There's hope. There's hope in that. I think so. Yeah, I think as long as there's hope and there's like things to work for, there's a lot of work to to do. Maybe, mm. maybe that's that's the reasoning behind what I tend to read. Mm. And so thinking, going back to your experience as a writer, Gustavo Aguilar from Lincoln wanted to know what kind of thoughts and feelings did you have while writing the book? Oh, man, there were some days where I probably cried more than I drew. Mm. And, and there's a picture in the inside cover um, of the book. There's like a there's this image of like little T, um, you know, Mm -hmm. Just like sitting there facing the wave. <laughs> that's kind of mm -hmm. how it felt. Mm -hmm. um, and that's just kind of how how it had to roll, you know, like, um, yeah. <laughs> do, you, um, do you feel like you got more comfortable experiencing those kind of emotions through the process of it? Or did it feel like that was something that you'd already kind of found your feet in as before you began the process of writing it? It had to go in fits and starts. Like it was kind of a lucky thing that it that mm. you know I had to balance working on this book with like life stuff. So mm -hmm. it, it did take me ten years because I was like, you know, working on it on the weekends or over yeah. spring break, and then I'd have to go back to teaching or raising mm -hmm. my son. And so it kind of gave me emotional breaks from the work too. Mm. Um, and that was that was actually really useful because it gave me time to like sift through the feelings and just just say what I wanted to say rather than mm. waiting through it for a whole year continuously. Yeah, um, and thinking about like the kind of the individual and collective experience, emotional experience of it. Um, uh, we got another question from Lincoln High School. What does your family think about about your book? What was what was their experience? Either you said that your parents acted as editors. I'm curious, like the, this, I, I'm hearing this question, I'm curious, both their experience of being involved in the creation of it and then also it being in the world. Yeah, yeah, I mean, gosh, imagine if I had not told them anything about it and then I just published this book. <laughs> I don't know if they would talk to me anymore. <laughs> um, I wouldn't feel good about that. Mm -hmm. um, no, I, I was um, self-publishing the individual chapters, like one chapter at a time when I was starting out. And that was a way for me to kind of sort of learn how to do comics mm. and participate in the comics world. Cause I was like taking it to like LA Zine Fest and um, <clears throat> uh, Ape and stuff and, mm -hmm. and tabling with it and selling my chapters for $5 a piece. It's really hard by the way, to sell a chapter about your, your, your labor <laughs> mm. at a Comic-Con. It was good <laughs> practice. Um, no, my dad saw the one I, I I had always meant for the chapter that was about me being terrified of him as a kid mm. with the chapter about his own terrifying childhood to like give context, mm. but I didn't draw fast enough. I drew too slowly. So I only had the chapter about how terrifying he was to me when I was little. Mm. And the chapter used to just be called terror. Mm. And I had it on my desk. Um, I didn't show it to him, but he came over. He just kind of read it on his own. And then he didn't talk to me for two weeks. Mm. I don't know if it was because of that or what, but he didn't talk to me for two weeks. And then finally he came back and he said, I read your chapter and I'm okay with it. The only thing I don't agree with was that painting of a naked lady that you put in there. I don't remember her being completely naked. So I'd like you to fix that. <laughs> so all I had to do was like draw some blades of grass in front of her and he was cool. But like, I was like, geez, I got off easy this time, but I better be careful. Um, so from now on, I'm mm. showing my parents like rough drafts of every chapter mm. before I even send them to my professional editor and um, I'll, I'll give them veto power if they want mm. it. But you know, what was funny is like, once I gave them that power, they never used it. They would mm. just remember more details and tell them to mm. me. So all my editing was actually like adding more rich detail. And also mm. like, you know, they were fact checking me in the process. So I felt really good actually about sharing with my parents something that I thought maybe I would have to hide. Yeah, what a beautiful opening of the door creatively. And then also um, step in your, in your, your parent-child relationship. Really yeah, nice. yeah, it was a sneaky way to spend quality time together. <laughs> well done. Very, very well done. <laughs> um, and I guess that, I think that leads beautifully into a question from a student from uh, Lincoln High School from Mr. Licon's class. Jesus Mata wants to know, did you have a favorite moment when you were writing the story? 
all my favorite moments where every time I got to write and draw about water. Mm. <clears throat> um, like I don't have dreams about flying. I have dreams about swimming. Like, mm. and I didn't really learn how to swim until I was 40. I finally like splurged and got myself some private lessons because it was too stressful to swim at the pool or at the public pool where there's like someone with a whistle blowing at you. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know, there's something about like being able to swim and be immersed in water that's like so peaceful. And like water is like this, maybe because I always think about drowning, water is this terrifying force that can take life as well as give life. And it's such a perfect like visual metaphor for so many things about human experience. It's so actually when I first outlined the book, it was all like mm. these metaphor, these metaphors involving water. Mm. Um, and anytime I got to draw like my mom swimming or my dad swimming or like peak boats on water, I was thrilled. Mm. I know that this has been a long process just to kind of understand the timeline. Where was your learning to swim in relationship with the writing and the release of the book? Um, there, close to the end, actually. Mm. Um, yeah, I think around the time that I was drawing those last images of like my 10 year old son swimming. Mm. That was when I was learning to swim. That's so that's so beautiful. And I, this is, I think, maybe a perfect segue into another student question. This one from Matthew Ball wanting to know, how has writing this book made you grow as a person? Ooh, um, you know, it, I, I started it on the cusp of, of becoming an adult or in the sense that like I was, an, a, I was a young adult, but like I, I still felt like I would always regress into being a kid again when I, was, mm. when I was around my parents. And then it was becoming a parent myself that made me go, whoa, there is no way you don't mess up this job. It's the mm. hardest job in the world. Um, and that level of empathy for my parents that I got to really unpack and explore um, mm. and, and, and give back to them. You know, I got to like spend a lot of time thinking about my parents before they became my parents. Mm. And that was a way for me to like just grow up the inner parts of myself that were still like you know an adolescent in relation to my parents mm -hmm. um and then just and then i think i grew up myself in the world by just finishing the book like i don't look back on it now go and go oh that was a masterpiece i actually find a lot of the art <laughs> a little bit cringy and some of the writing is not quite right but it's the best I could do with where I was at at that time. That's actually mm. my built-in disclaimer into the title. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, when you become someone who finishes things, even if it was just one thing, but it was a big thing, like there's a confidence that you develop. Mm. So if there, if there are folks in the audience who like are creators and, and, and you're not sure if you get to be an artist in the world, like just start finishing things. So, so create mm. small projects for yourself and finish them. And then move on to the next one and the next one. And you'll find that you develop this confidence in yourself as a storyteller, as a creator, as a voice. We were talking mm. about the importance of, of, of um, finding your voice earlier. And I think that's how you do it. You just, you speak, you finish yeah. things. I so, I deeply appreciate that. Cause I feel like we, like a, a, a very common piece of advice is just start it, just go for it. But that that advice of like of finish it and keep moving on to the next things like start it and follow through and follow through and follow through. That's that's incredibly beautiful. Thank you. Thank you for that. I feel like all of us adults on the all of us older folks on the on the Zoom as well are, are listening and like taking that to heart. Also. <laughs> yeah. And don't be afraid of failure either. Like, you know, if if if, if the choice is either between making it perfect or getting it done, choose getting it done. Mm. Right. And then just keep moving on and, and keep learning from that. Yeah. And be, we got a, a student question, maybe one of the most vulnerable ones. Um, and they said, only if you feel comfortable sharing it. So uh, from Mendez High School, Angelica Heredia has a, a business question for you. So on the business side of book <laughs> writing and publishing, how much money is made from the book? Like, is, it, is this uh, is like, I don't know, like I'm, uh, I'm, I'm finding the questions behind the questions as well, thinking about mm -hmm. like, how do you make a career as a writer? So mm -hmm. the student question, how much money was made from the book? And then I'm curious, like if for students who might want to 
be a writer as a career? How do you build a career as a writer? Yeah, no, that's a really important question because like the the business of getting the books out there is actually a big part of like, you know, how impactful the book can be. So if you go with a major publisher, they're usually able to offer you an advance on your royalties. Um, so royalties can go anywhere from, you know, just a few percentage points on the book to um, more depending on like how well you negotiate. And like, mm. I didn't know anything about negotiating when I was negotiating the contract for this book and I didn't have an agent. I feel so like I it actually, comes back to your like entitlement question, like yeah. be, be entitled for, to, mm -hmm. to your work. Yeah, and, and get people who um, like get some heavies in your corner <laughs> to, mm. to, who know the business too. Um, so like I basically make a cup of coffee for every book sold and I'm not talking like fancy Starbucks coffee. I'm talking like <laughs> bodega coffee. Um, so luckily the book has sold a lot. So, you know, I, I, I get royalty checks twice a year. Um, and your advance is like, you know, uh, kind of a, a, a prepayment on those royalties. Um, so that helps, you know, it helps you like take a little bit of time off from your day job to be able to work on it. And then, um, you know, you kind of, I think all artists that I know who come from a working class background have to work multiple jobs mm -hmm. when they get started. Um, but uh, finding like a network of support for these mm -hmm. kind of business questions is really, really helpful because mm -hmm. um, people can give you some advice, can look over your contracts um, and can help you like not fall into some pitfalls that like, mm -hmm beginners can if they are too scared to ask any of the questions. So thank you for asking a business question. I'm always happy to answer those. I think we have time for, for one last question. Um, and before, before you answer, I just wanna say such a huge thank you to for being with us and for, for sharing your book with us and sharing um, again, so vulnerably uh, with your, uh, of, of yourself. Um, so we've got, we've got two student questions. They're, they're very different. Um, but I'll share them, share them both just since they're, they're in the chat. And if there's one that you want to jump in or if they're somehow jump, uh, somehow compelled to answer both. Um, if your parents never migrated, how different do you think life would have been? That's a question from Matthew Ball. Um, and uh, Genesis Gaeta wants to know, what does your writing process look like? So those are very, very divergent questions. Yeah. But la last questions from our students, um, maybe just a, a moment to share this, the, the tip of the iceberg of a, of a thought on that. Um, sure, um, you know, for a, a, in a multiverse, um, actually I think that my life might have maybe been something like the, the life of this author that I met named Nguyen Phan Gui Mai, who wrote a book. She's a Vietnamese author, but she wrote a book in English called The Mountains Sing. And you should definitely check it out because she stayed in Vietnam and she, her family was from the North. So the other side of the war, and it, it just gives this other, dimension to the war that you should definitely check out. And I think that my life might've been like hers. There would have been like a lot of poverty in the early part of my life, but maybe I would have found a way to write anyway um, mm -hmm. and get my story out there. And I, I would also be better at Vietnamese. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and my writing process is so messy. I'm, I'm, I'm still trying to work on better habits, um, <laughs> but I try to use like I try to, re if on a good day, if I remember, then I use my my good morning energy for mm. creative work and I mm. save the emails and like business admin stuff till later in the day. <laughs> mm -hmm. And when I get stuck on an idea, I go walking. Mm. I appreciate that. I, 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 I appreciate thinking of writing as an embodied process that we that, uh, that, that you warm up for, that it is something that we do in our in our bodies. Definitely. Um, T, I want to say one more huge thank you to you and also thank all of our behind the scenes folks, um, our technical director, Scott Bay, our graphic designer and event coordinator who made these these beautiful uh, um, frames behind behind me and behind our, our other host, Luz Rodriguez, um, our music selection and technical assistant, Henry Mendez. Um, and lastly, the remind was similar to what Elizabeth was saying earlier. The music is all from Lincoln High students, or sorry, Lincoln Heights Youth Art Center students created during pandemic. And the, the song great. we're going to hear as we're saying goodbye is uh, is from is called "Beat" by Jason Martinez. So, T, thank you once more from all of us. Um, deep, in, deeply inspired by your work and your words. Thank you so much, and look forward to to reading more of your reading and seeing more of your work. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.
Bobby, you're so good at that. Oh, do, doing my best. It was very inspiring to hear your your uh, responses and so hard not to just ask a million of my own follow up questions. <laughs> because I'm so excited to be getting to speak with you. I don't know if we get to talk yet, but you guys did such a beautiful job. Thank Congratulations. You. T, you. you're such a you're such a phenomenal, dynamic um, human being. I'm so grateful that on behalf of our students, we got to have you share, um, just like we said, the story behind the story. And I'm just so excited for who gets to see this even after today. So oh, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. I, hope, I, hope, I hope the kids have a good day. Yeah. <laughs> we, we, we are still streaming. So I uh, thank you to everyone who, who okay. tuned in or is seeing this later. Um, and uh, Scott, if we can close down the streaming, I think we, we've we've reached a good moment to say goodbye to everyone online. Okay, I will stuck. So if everybody could just uh, leave, uh, the stream will end on its own. Got it. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much, Steve.